Thanks so much for inviting me to Chaos Conf. I'm very excited to be here and thank you to Gremlin. So today I'm gonna to talk about um, the five things you can do to reduce operational load. And so, you know, obviously most of you are here because you believe in the principles of DevOps and the idea that as a development team, you are balancing the needs of the business for new capabilities and revenue growth with the needs to ensure the operability of your services, reduce downtime and incidents, and make sure that work is manageable for you and your team. So of course, the best way to reduce operational load is when you have a problem to fix the underlying cause and spend the time that's required to do that. Now, this is the most important effort towards reducing operational load and ensuring your customers get a good experience. Um, but today I'm gonna to talk about other complementary things that you can do to reduce operational load and why it's important to have these other tactics to reduce load along with just simply fixing the underlying problems. So I'm actually gonna start with why are having these other tactics so important. I have a couple movie references in this um, session. This is the first one. And so, um, you know, maybe everyone who recognizes this, it's a little bit um, back there in time, can post it in the Slack channel if you recognize the movie. So sometimes it is hard to um, fix underlying issues. And why is that? Well, maybe you have a monolith as shown in the picture. Maybe there's another reason why the work needed is very difficult to do. Um, maybe you have planned to do the work, but you know it's going to take a lot of time. It's something you're going to invest in, but you know, you're just stuck in a world where not all your incidents root causes can be eradicated quickly. Also, following DevOps principles doesn't mean that incidents won't happen. You want them to be within your error budget, but that means that they're not zero. In fact, if they are zero, you're probably not innovating and changing enough. So if you're investing in and growing your business, you're constantly riding that edge between agility and innovation and stability and performance. You're continuing to make changes and the unexpected will happen. So having good processes to minimize incidents when they do happen is key. Lastly, whether you have incidents caused by moving fast or because some operational pain is not easily corrected, the stress on digital systems has been exacerbated in the last six months, increasing operational load across the board. So I have some data actually to share on that. Um, just looking at across all incidents in PagerDuty, across our platform, we've seen that the um, incidents have increased about 38% in the six months following the start of the pandemic versus the six months before. That's a pretty significant increase. And it's largely because the pandemic, of course, has forced an abrupt shift to largely digital only services and working from home. And as Sachi Nadella and many others have highlighted, we're essentially seeing two years worth of digital transformation in two months. And this is really just average. Um, when we look across different verticals, we've seen much higher increases, especially immediately following the pandemic especially um, with verticals like e-learning or collaboration tools, went up to, up to 10 or 11 times the number of incidents. Now, we're not only seeing this in our data, we've also run a survey to see what teams are experiencing um, in terms of increased operational load. And some pretty startling results, we see that 62% of respondents, and this was across 700 people around the world, we're spending 10 or more extra hours a week resolving incidents. We saw that 55% um, are being asked to resolve incidents during their personal time five or more times a week, that 40% expect this digital pressure to even get worse in the next six to 12 months, and that 39% are firefighting or focused on unplanned work 100% of the time. So every company is really facing this challenge of accelerated digital demand. And these, this data also points to the human cost of the shift, that this, there's a significant strain on practitioners charged with keeping digital services running. And you know when there is too much operational load, again, the obvious answer is to invest in resiliency, 
But there are a set of complementary investments you can make, easy things that you can do to offload your team and your cells and reduce or mitigate toil. So I'm gonna talk about those things, the five things that you can do to reduce your operational load using automation. There's a lot of different ways that automation can help incident response um, and Let's start with automating collaboration during an incident. So again, assuming that incidents are going to happen, when you have a major incident, it's really important to get the right people and only the right people together. Over the years, I've talked to lots of customers about this and many, especially larger companies say that it takes them about 45 minutes to assemble all the people that they need to resolve a major incident. There's no real reason it needs to take that long. It can be a lot shorter. It can take about five minutes um, if you have the right systems in place and use automation. And so what that requires is first, programmatically knowing who's responsible for what, so which teams own which service and who's on call right now. And also establishing your communication procedures. So what is the bridge that you want to use? Set that up ahead of time. Um, what is your chat tool? Which channel are you using? And making sure that when you notify people about an issue, the links or the information to easily one click and get into all these places are available. And then lastly, it's important to reach people wherever they are. So if during the day you're spending your time in Slack or Teams, then that's where you notify people. If after hours you're by your mobile phone, then notify people there. Doing all these things really helps reduce needless time spent waiting or spinning wheels on issues, waiting for the right people to show up. And it, of course, helps you solve customer problems faster. Now, you might remember I mentioned getting all the people you need and none of the people that you don't. Well, that leads to the next way you can utilize automation um, around reducing operational load, and that's automating stakeholder communications. So this is the second movie reference. Um, and I think it's a little bit too easy just to um, say in the Slack maybe what the movie is. So I'm gonna ask everyone if you know it to, who is the character that is shown? So getting back to automating stakeholder communication, um, our digital business is now our business. And so what this means is that when something goes wrong with your digital stack, there's a lot of other teams across the organization that need to know for various reasons. Um, let's say that if the trial signup isn't working, well, then you want to make sure that the marketing team knows maybe they want to reduce their SEO spend so they're not sending people and paying for them to go to something that's not going to work. Um, other things, so customer service. Are they about to get a barrage of complaints because of an issue they don't know about? So maybe they can proactively notify customers with useful information and they themselves can be kept in the loop. Sales. So can we avoid them having an unexpected problem in the middle of a demo? Um, they can also potentially proactively reach out to customers with reassurance if there is an issue going on. And then even executives, um, as I mentioned earlier, the last thing they want is their manager calling them about a customer issue that they don't know about. And so it's really important to keep them informed. The other important reason to do this is that having executives on incident calls, I'm sure many of you know this, can really slow things down. They join, ask what's going on, progress stops while they're being updated, um, and the people closest to the issue typically know how to solve it, and any other people at that time are really just distracting from the task at hand. Now, how do you automate this? Well, similar to automating collaboration, there's a systematic way of knowing you need to know who needs to be notified of issues with various services, um, ensure that they get the messages that make sense to them. So making sure that the message talks about the business impact, not just the underlying service that's having an issue. 
And you can automate all of this um, for people. And you could even make it so that someone can send out the message automatically to the right person or even totally automate the whole process when something goes wrong, if you want. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is automating diagnosis. So again, assuming that you have an incident, um, if you can automate some of your diagnosis, you can get to fixing it faster. Now there's plenty of tools out there that will talk about determining root cause, the exact line of code, that's a problem. And typically this is a bit of a pipe dream. It's really hard to do that. I mean, if it was so easy, we would, we would all be doing it. But short of that perfect determination of cause, there are things that you can do to speed up the diagnosis and make it a lot easier for responders. And when I've talked to companies about the problem of root cause and diagnosing problems, there's typically two questions that always boil to the top. And the first one is, what recently changed? And the second one is, um, is it me or is it not me? Is it my service or is it some underlying service or something else that is causing the problem? Now, just narrowing down the root cause to the right underlying service and or the suspect change shaves minutes, if not dozens of minutes off of the downtown. And you can automatically collect this information and make it available to the responder. Um, you could pipe in changes to automatically surface within an incident response platform. And you can also ensure you have an up-to-date service directory and surface any incidents on upstream services that could be the cause of what's happening right now from the moment that the responder gets the page so that they know that maybe another service is causing the issue. The next thing that I'll talk about that you can do to reduce operational load is automating remediation. So as I mentioned at the beginning, when you have a problem, really the ideal thing to do is to solve it at its root to make sure that it doesn't happen again. But again, world is not perfect. And sometimes it is hard to do that. Sometimes the investment will take time. And sometimes you're stuck for a period of time with some repeat issues. So if you can identify repeat issues that are happening, um, the next thing you can do is figure out if there are a set of steps that you can take to remediate it and if those steps are generally repeatable and automate those steps. Now, a lot of times, and I've talked to customers about this too, I had someone once say to me, and it really made an impact, you know, auto remediation sounds great, but what if 85% of the time the auto remediation steps will solve the problem, 10% of the time, it won't do anything. And 5% of the time, it actually makes the problem worse. So it may be scary to use auto remediation in that situation, but there are ways to do that. And you can start by having human initiated automation. So instead of just automatically running the system, you still get a person to know about the problem and you give them a push button way of running the automation. And so it still saves time, still saves that person's time of having to look up a run book and having to do things manually. So it's still valuable. And after a period of time of that working, then maybe you're comfortable with um, automatically kicking it off, but still getting a person to make sure that nothing is going wrong. And then once you're comfortable there, then you can graduate to Let's just kick it off and we'll only get a person to look at it if it doesn't actually resolve the issue. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about the last way of automating. And this is around automating what I'll call non-incidents. So all of the other things were about when you have an incident, how can you be a lot more effective and reduce the operational pain and load of those incidents? This one is how do you reduce interruptions altogether. So I'm going to talk about a couple scenarios here. The first one is you get a notification and you act it, you look at it, and you feel like maybe you've seen it before. You start to do some diagnostics or maybe you, you've 
look at the diagnostic data you have if you're doing the third thing I talked about. And then the issue within like a minute resolves itself. Just looking at data again in our, our pager duty environment, we see over 14% of alerts fall into this category. There are um, issues that needlessly interrupt people or wake even wake people up. Um, when they're highly likely to be auto-remediated within just a few minutes. Or they're just blips that are monitoring tools being a little bit too sensitive and they resolve themselves within a few minutes. Now, if you do this analysis and you see where these are, you can just put a short pause on these incidents and it saves you a lot of pain and effort. You just don't ever get notified if they auto-resolve themselves within a few minutes. Second scenario, is, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this one, that something goes wrong and you're flooded with alerts. Um, you have to look though at every single one. And the reason for that is that maybe within that flood, that's probably related to one underlying problem. There is maybe one or two alerts that are indicative of a separate problem and you don't wanna miss those. Just looking at our data, up to 50% of the alerts that we see in our system fall into this category. They really could be safely grouped together and you don't have to waste time looking at them all individually. So that would save a lot of time if you didn't even have to look at up to 50% of the incidents or notifications that you're getting. So in summary, there are a lot of things that you can do using automation to cut down on operational pain. And, you know, to reduce operational load, other than just fixing the underlying problem, which of course is the first thing you should do, um, you can automate response collaboration, can automate communication, you can surface important information for diagnostics to cut down the time it takes to resolve or get to root cause. Um, you can automate remediation steps and you can cut down noise and toil by reducing non-incidents. And all of these techniques really allow you to reduce the time the team's spending on manual work and allowing them and yourselves to spend more time on innovation. So reducing this number of incidents altogether that need to be managed it allows you to fix things faster and of course, create a much better experience for your customers. So thank you for that. And with that, I think we're going to take some questions. Yep, I think we have some questions coming in. Um, I think Rachel, one of the, the ones that people are particularly interested in is getting that automation around uh, building the context, right, of, of gathering that information. I'm curious if you could dive a little deeper into that. Like what what sorts of information do you find is the easiest to, to begin that automation journey? Yeah, so there's a lot of really important context that when you are first told that there is an issue, um, that can help. Now, of course, you get context from typically the monitoring tool and the alert itself. Um, but there's a lot of other contexts that can really help. And I did talk about two things. Um, and one is, you know, are there other issues happening right now? So are there other issues happening that could be related to the one that you're seeing? And even more importantly, happening on services that you're dependent on. And so that's, you know, it's a couple layers of information there. You need to know, are there other incidents and are those incidents on services that you're dependent on? So you need to have that dependency information as well. Um, there's one I didn't mention actually is, um, has this happened before, right? So um, it's really nice if you can get a view of, you know, have similar incidents like this happen before. And that's really important because the typical way of going on call, of course, is that you're like a week on and then you're six weeks off. And so there's a lot of incidents that may be happening that you never see because you're on call for your week period. And then there's another week and that next week, that person may not be aware that the same thing happened the week earlier. And so that's another piece of context I didn't talk about 
The other one I did talk about was, of course, changes. So, you know, I ask and talk to a lot of customers about, you know, what typically causes issues and, you know, or how much, how many issues are caused by change. And the answer I get varies from like 50% to 90%. So most issues, everyone, it's always 50 or more. Most issues that you see are caused by some sort of change in your system. And so if you can just keep the running tally of changes that have happened that are that are relevant to that service, um, it's it's often a place where people want to start. Yeah, that's some some good insight there. I'm curious, um, you know, all of that having that sort of that tree or that that diagram of being able to see what's connected. Um, I'm curious if, you know, that obviously feeds into the idea of once you have that information, it definitely helps for the next step that you mentioned of the auto remediation. Um, but, you know, as everybody on this call, I'm sure is familiar with um, auto remediation can sometimes go really sideways. So I'm curious um, if you can talk a little bit about that and and how to maybe potentially mitigate that. Yeah. Um, so this is something that we've um, been thinking about a lot. And we have this concept or thought, we call it sometimes safe auto remediation. Um, and it's the idea that, that maybe you want to have a person babysitting it, right? So you're not yet comfortable that it's going to work 100% on its own. And so sometimes this is called like an Iron Man situation where you're giving a person a lot of power to um, to kick off a set of automated steps, but that they're watching it and making sure that it's working. So it's still good for the person because otherwise they would have had to do those things manually. So it saves them time. Um, it also creates a record of, of that thing being kicked off. Um, but it also means that they're there as a backup in case anything goes wrong. And so I think this is really the best way to ease into remediation or auto remediation is by starting out by at least creating the scripts and the automation, but maybe kicking them off manually until you're comfortable with it. And you'll have a record of whether it works or doesn't work. And if you see it working every time, then you can decide to graduate it. And this is a process that actually will happen naturally because if every time something happens and you press a button and it works, eventually the person will get sick of pressing that button. And they'll just say, look, I don't need to be in the middle of this. I don't need to be woken up to do this. It's working every single time. I'm comfortable at this point. Let me get out of the mix. And so it's kind of a very natural progression. It, it serves to make people comfortable. And then eventually when they get comfortable, they're not going to want to do it anyway. And then, of course, you know, you want to just make sure that um, that the person is still there as a backup. So let's say you're comfortable, you fully auto remediate it, you're fully automating it. And you just want to make sure that if, if it doesn't work, that then that notification still goes out and someone's called in, they can see it ran, they can see it didn't work and, and they know what to do. So there is a really safe way, I think, to, to do this, that even at every stage still provides benefit, even at the earliest stage, because even just giving someone a push button way of doing it will save them time. Yeah. I like that idea of having a, a human in the loop. Um, I know that PagerDuty, like you, you, the folks on your team have, have definitely talked about this a lot when it comes to incident command, but I'm curious with that human in the loop, what are, what's some advice for not, uh, or ensuring that that doesn't become one person. I always find that like when I naturally, mm -hmm. or when I'm on teams that naturally do this, um, that it, it eventually becomes that this person's the, the subject matter expert, right? The, 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 the SME on it. And so they're always that person in the loop. I'm curious if you have advice for like, how do you spread that responsibility out among a team? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I think it first starts or one place you can start with just being aware when that's happening. And so, you know, one thing that we, we do in PagerDuty, but you can do is, you know, you can get an idea across a team of who is handling all the incidents and who ends up spending most the most time doing that. And when you have an incident, is this one person always called in, right? So if you have that information, those metrics, then you know you have a problem. So sometimes the first step of this is just knowing that you have a problem and this is happening. 
And then you can put in place sharing, you know, knowledge sharing, right? So this, you can't last like that. That person eventually is going to burn out. It's not a good way to be. And so you never want to get into that situation. So I'd say, you know, I, I think it does naturally happen sometimes, but just being vigilant and making sure you're aware and you see the data on it and you can nip it in the bud before it gets too bad. That's probably the most important thing. Yeah. There's a question that came in that, that segues nicely. Um, and the question is to what do you attribute the increase in alerts during the pandemic? And then with a follow-up of what kind of stress are you seeing because of that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we attribute it just to the increased load on all of these systems. Um, so, you know, when during the pandemic, everyone went to work from home, no one was going to stores anymore. Everything had to be essentially um, contracted online. And so the reason why we're, we're, we attribute it to that is because we certainly saw when we looked across verticals that the verticals we knew were the heaviest hit were the ones that were seeing the most incidents. So it's just, it's just simply an increase in volume of traffic and transactions. You know, we saw that, um, I think it was e-learning had 11 X when we looked across e-learning vertical in our system, 11 times the number of incidents in the few weeks following, um, you know, when everyone went to work from home. Um, I think it was collaboration tools was like eight X. And so, you know, clearly those were the hardest hit, but everyone, you know, across the board was hit. In those early days, I think on average, we saw about 2x across all verticals, but those those particular verticals were the hardest hit. Yeah, I think definitely tons of services, including uh, the platform that we're on. Earlier this week, Slack had a, a minor outage as we were uh, doing workshops. So yeah, <laughs> lots of folks uh, experiencing issues, but thankfully, uh, you know, have tools like PagerDuty to help things get resolved quickly. With that said, um, we are about out of time here. So if you'd like to continue chatting with Rachel, she'll be in her Slack channel, um, QA-Rachel-Obstler. Um, thanks again for joining us and providing us such wonderful insight about automating, and hopefully that'll help get a lot of us on track to reducing alerts. Yep. Thank you, Jason. Thanks so much for having me.